be our text today, and it's just so always important to remember the background in the book of Acts. Acts is, uh, in many respects, a continuation of the book of Luke. Acts is the text that helps us to see how the disciples immediately experience not only the ministry of Jesus, but the call of Jesus to go and make disciples. And uh, it is certainly, the book of Acts, a very powerful expression and record of how uh, Christian faith was never meant to be lived in isolation. Hello, somebody. Amen. Amen. That if you're going to follow Jesus, you got to follow Jesus with some other folk who are following Jesus. I mean, Jesus didn't uh, tell his disciples to go and hang out by yourself. I mean, you know, that's a modern construction of Christian faith. That it's just me and Jesus and nobody else. Hallelujah. First of all, you're not that important, amen. I'm just playing. Sorry the kind I'm playing. How many know when you, you, you get along with Jesus, you can get seduced by a lot of subjectivity? Uh, and, 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 and hear Jesus through your own ears and through your own uh, experience. But when you at least coupled up with a few other folks, you can begin to discern what God is doing because God is working not just in you, but God is working and speaking to many others around. And so the book of Acts is a great expression of how the universality of the message of the gospel of Jesus was not only preached to men and women, to those who were on the inside and those who were on the outside, but it was also a powerful example and historical plumb line, if you will, to help all of us to know that uh, when Jesus speaks and when Jesus calls, Jesus speaks and calls through his spirit to all of us and not just a selected few. And uh, for all you who ain't, you know, uh, born out of your mother's womb, speaking in tongues and walking on water and healing the dead or healing the sick and raising the dead, you ought to thank the Lord that there ain't just a select few. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm included in that number. Amen. That God has made a way for me to have access. And that is indeed the great gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the book of Acts then is a historical record that helps us to appreciate that when the church was launched formally after Jesus' ascension and the disciples gathering in the upper room, uh, that it was launched with power and with mission. And uh, let's see a little bit about what not only the text is, 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 is speaking, but all across the world in the church uh, particularly there is a celebration of Pentecost and there is great, great impact and relevance for us today. The book of Acts chapter number two, it should be on the screen. Uh, if you uh, would like to follow along in our church Bible, certainly go ahead and turn there. We're going to do a little bit of reading. We're going to read, I think, the first 21 verses. So go ahead and just get ready to uh, catch up on some reading because I know some of y'all ain't read all week. Amen. Uh. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Uh. Filled the entire house. Nothing left untouched, unfilled. And divided tongues as a fire appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Verse number five, now... There were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them 
speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? So y'all tracking what's happening here. Yeah. Amen. It's like, you know, these folk gathering together and they, I guess, having some kind of a prayer meeting, a fellowship. Holy Spirit hits the, hits the, hits the house, hits the upper room, and it don't say it's a nice, cool breeze. Says it's a violent wind shook the house where they were sit, feeling or sitting, and 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 then people around them, minding their own business, heard folks speaking in a number of languages, and it all made them take notice because they realized that these folks speaking were not bilingual or multilingual people; they were Galileans. Verse number not eight. And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed. You know, you, your brain must be doing a whole lot to be perplexed and amazed all at the same time. <laughs> Saying to one another, what does this mean? Hmm. But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. Maybe Jamie Foxx said, blame it on the I, 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 I. Mm. Just get, trying to give you a point of reference of what they probably were saying. Verse number 14, but Peter standing with the 11 raised his voice and addressed them. He said, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. We're going to talk about that another time. <laughs> no, somebody say no. no. No, this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. That in the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Go down to verse number 21. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic today, when fire fell from heaven. When fire fell from heaven. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts. So we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let the power of your spirit be rich and full in this place. Touch us with your fire. Touch us with your spirit. Touch us with your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 
Oh, my goodness. I think it is so important to contextualize even more so how significant this act of Pentecost was given the most immediate realities that had just taken place in the life of these disciples. Now, I know Easter is long out of some of our minds. We've gotten past the Easter bunny and Easter brunch and Easter photos. But I want you to be reminded that for these disciples, Easter, resurrection morning, was still very much for them arguably the single greatest event that had shaped their lives. I mean, it is indeed the case that life before Easter was for these Jewish believers an age of terror. For they were indeed as God's people acutely aware that they are and were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they were the promised people, the covenant people, and they were called to be a nation and a kingdom without end. Free to worship God. Free to live out their covenant responsibilities. And this people still had to wrestle with this reality that we are God's people, but we are living in bondage. We're living under the reign and the rule of an empire called Rome. And our daily lives are constantly under consistent attack. We are being cheated in our taxes. We are finding all these rising groups trying to overthrow the government. We are spread all across the region. We can't own much. We can't move without constantly being under the watchful eye of the Roman guard. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Now, you got to appreciate that Passover was a annual feast where the Jews would gather and they would always leave a seat open at their table just in case the Messiah decided to show up. They wanted every household to be sure if the Messiah showed up, you got a seat at my table because I don't want my table to be so full that deliverance can't show up. So they people living in expectation. Jesus shows up and Jesus starts to speak like, talk like, act like a promise they'd been waiting for. But as the story goes, and we know the story, Jesus does not overthrow the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, Jesus becomes a casualty of the Roman Empire. And he's killed and executed just like many had come before him. Their lives daily characterized by terror. And I don't want to minimize all of the terror-like events happening in our world today and cause you and I to read this text about Pentecost in a vacuum. Because how many of you know there are a lot of folk we know, dare I say, some in this congregation who are living every day in a terror-like situation? I mean, it's terrible, the, the terror attack that happened in London yesterday. It's terrible, the consistent attacks that happen all across the world, whether you in Palestine or South America, parts of Africa, 
It's terrible, the terror attack that happened here in the United States with these, these, these right-wing extremist, white supremacist nationalists who become very bold. Then you even got folk who you think are supposed to be your friends. Using terror-like language and tactics to cause our hearts and our minds, if we will be honest, to buckle. If I were to bring it even more home, I would argue that some of us have had to go to the doctor this week. Got called into the office of your boss. Had to change your number for the 10th time. Because all these bill collectors keep calling your house. Your children demonstrated once again that their addiction is stronger than their ability to live free. I mean, we, we, we not people who aren't aware of what life looks like when we are not overshadowed by the possibility of Easter and resurrection. And this is the environment these disciples were living in. They had a shadow of what the world looked like without resurrection because remember, after Jesus was crucified, their response was to go hide in a room. May have been the same upper room they in right now. But when Jesus arose again and showed himself to them, Jesus told them very explicitly, listen, now that you have seen the impossible, don't just run out there to try and do the unique work I've called you to do. Don't just run out there and try to bear witness to everyone you may know or think needs to hear, but go back to Jerusalem and stay there and wait for a new power that I'm going to send you from on high. Now, you got to appreciate that what Jesus is trying to help the disciples understand is if you are going to live in, as a revolutionary person in a oppressive age, you need a different kind of power. <laughs> Hello, somebody. I mean... You know, you have a whole lot of folk who are tapping into all kinds of powers. Some folk feel like, well, I just need to work my fingers to the bone to get as much economic power as I can so I can then have the ability to be revolutionary, to be powerful. How many of you know that economic power may not be the key to your liberation, if your inner heart is not changed, because you can be rich and still be quite a devil. Amen. Some say, well, I want to get political power. Because if I have the power politically, then of course I can make all the decisions and create a just society. And of course... We know that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that political power in and of itself can often just recreate the very thing that we are often trying to break free from. So when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, Jesus is trying to help them realize that none of these things are inherently bad or insufficient. But you need some power that you've not yet experienced before to do the work that I've uniquely called you to do. And child of God, I want you to know today that God has a unique call for each and every one of us. And we collectively as the way and the national or international or global church in particular. 
that we are a chosen generation, Peter would say, a royal priesthood. God's holy nation, a peculiar people who God has called out of darkness into a marvelous light. Why? So we can show forth his praises. We can make God known to the world, to those whom God has placed in our path. Now, for many of us, making God known is evacuated or Fully fulfilled by giving somebody a track. Have you known Jesus? <laughs> and you move on to the next person. Have you known Jesus? And you have some folk who feel like, well, I'm checking my boxes. Because I've given out 10 of those this week. <laughs> then you have some folk who feel like making Jesus known is about being super spiritual, you know, folk who can practice a whole lot of great things in the four walls of the church, but can't make Christ known where there ain't no preacher, no organ, or no pews. Could it be, people of God, that all of these silos of making Christ known are not intended or scripted by the one who is giving us the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when you look at the life of Jesus and the subsequent actions of his disciples, you see wherever they went, in the temple, in the marketplace, in the halls of power, in their homes, the power of the Spirit allowed Christ to be made known to everyone they were around. I want to submit to you, child of God, that there is a fire that will come from heaven in our lives that will allow us to burn in such a way where your location does not dictate Christ being known. Hmm. So how many know when you see a fire, you are not hung up on location? You can see a fire burning from miles away if it's big enough. We were in our office the other day, and me, Anton, some of us, and we sit in our office, and all of a sudden, we, we smelling something. And then we hear a helicopter, and we walk outside on the balcony of our office, and we looking around, and we can't see nothing. But we smelled something was on fire. Fire has the ability to hit most, if not all, of your senses. Mm hmm. Hello, somebody. You touch the fire, you're going to what? Feel it. Mm hmm. You can hear the crackling of the fire tearing up something. You can see the flame. You can smell its, its, its effect and impact. When the fire of God hits our lives, you don't get to choose what impact the fire has on you. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody today. Because uh, the fire is indiscriminate. The fire will go wherever the fire feels like going. And don't you add a little bit of wind in that fire. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, be careful of the wind. Be careful of the wind. Fire, when it is in its purest form, it purifies everything it touches. Fire can get so hot. I, I used to be one of them pyro, what, what do you call it? pyromaniacs wanted to burn everything. You know, you sit there in front of a fire and you're just like, ooh. Ooh. You're just trying to figure out what can I throw in this fire to get the biggest how that plastic start 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 just just disappearing in my mind trying to figure out will this paper burn faster than this log? 
if I keep this stick in my hand and the fire just eats up the stick, how long can I keep it in my hand before it burns me? Was I the only one? Amen. Was I the only one? <laughs> fire purifies. Fire consumes. Fire illuminates. Fire brings warmth. Listen, fire will keep burning as long as there's something to burn. And you better understand, child of God, that the reason why we need the fire of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives is not so we could claim to be more spiritual than somebody else. It is so we can be the witnesses perpetually that God requires in a fallen world. So the world will never forget who God is. Mm. To be mindful, the early church, they believed in the parousia, the, the, the imminent return of Jesus, as do we. If Jesus is coming back, Jesus is going to come back and Jesus is going to make some things right, make everything right. That's why the saying Jesus, I think I said it last week, get right or what? Get left. Amen. That's what we used to talk about. Jesus coming back. Give me a high five. Jesus still coming back. He coming back. I don't know when. I don't know. But you better get right. You better get left. But it's so interesting because, listen, the disciples living in an age of terror. Interrupted by the promise and the radical uh, miracle of resurrection still had to go back and live in an age of terror. Them being filled with, or them experiencing resurrection did not change who was running the government. It did not change the imminent threats that were on their lives. But Jesus knew that if you're going to do what I'm calling you to do, you need to go and wait until you are clothed, the scripture says, with power from on high. I want you to know God's trying to give somebody in here an extreme makeover, amen. Because some, so, so some of us in here, we, we, we wearing some clothes, but they're not the right kind of clothes. They're not the clothes that will give you the power necessary to be sustained in an age of terror. In an age where you are called to be God's witnesses in an age of terror. Because how many of you know it's one thing to be a witness when there ain't no pressure on you. <laughs> uh-huh. And, and, and it, it, it's even another thing to be a witness when the pressure ain't really, you know, coming your way. You're like, oh, man, that's terrible what's happening. I was in, in, in having lunch or dinner with some folk. You need some very affluent folk. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I was invited there because we trying to raise some money and get some money out of these affluent folk. Praise God. Help them fund the revolution. Touch your neighbor. Amen. And, and, and so it's so fascinating because, you know, everybody in there drinking that I, 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 the alcohol. Amen. And, and, and I'm, 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 the, I'm the sober one. Praise God. For a number of reasons. Amen. Because I got to keep my story straight. Praise God. <laughs> But it's so fascinating that when you're not close to the problem, you can philosophize and have a party all through the misery of other people. When you are far away from terror, you can always tell folk what they should be doing. Well, you should forgive. You should be nonviolent. You should, and I'd be like, shut your mouth, amen. <laughs> Part of what the Holy Spirit, the fire of Pentecost did for the disciples was give them a boldness and an audacity to be a witness perpetually without interruption. To have the words, the right words to speak. Hallelujah. 
to move with acts of power that were undeniable to the watcher. The watcher, the person who's looking to hear what others can't hear, to see what others can't see. The power of the fire of Pentecost was the inbreaking of the church of Jesus Christ in the world because I believe that Jesus knew that terror was going to be a continuous reality for the true follower of Jesus. What then must you and I do to be prepared to receive the fire that comes from heaven. Because I want to let you know this fire is not limited, nor is it being handed out in rations. <laughs> you know, I was at the doctor and trying to figure out what's going on with my body and my everything. And the doctor was saying, well, you know, I told him we getting ready to go on the fast. He said, oh, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. And your, your diet will change. Said, but let's say well, after you get done with the fast, you need to get something that's a little bit more, more routine, routinized and, and, and your diet. He said, have you ever heard of Blue Apron? <laughs> Touch your neighbor. Hey, man, I, I wasn't able to snap because I know what he was talking about. I was like, I, I don't wear no aprons, praise God. I was, when I'm trying to keep stuff off me, I just get a napkin and I just tuck it in my, th I don't know what you're talking about, a blue apron. He was like, no, brother, I'm not talking about no blue. It's an app and it's, a, it's a, a food program where you are given food in certain proportions. They shop for you, they box it up and they send it to you. So you don't have to just be, you know, and I was sitting there like, that is deep. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> But God is not pouring out God's spirit like a Blue Apron app, you know, where God is like, okay, you only need half a cup of this and a package of that, a few fruits for, no, 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 no. That, that, at least that's not how the, the scripture says. The scripture tells us that when they were all together in one place, that the Holy Spirit showed up with such power and force that a violent wind filled the room. There was no rationing going out. Everything that was in proximity of the Spirit got touched. And not just touched. Because how many know you come to church and we can get a touch? Woo, thank you, Jesus. Woo. Mm -mm -mm. Tears, heart strangely warmed, as the Methodists would say. A shimmy in your side, as some of the Pentecostals say. The Baptists, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, you know. But how many of you know there's a difference between a touch and a infilling? I don't know. It's Pentecost Sunday. Y'all like, what is he talking about? Give it a high five and tell we talking about Pentecost today. Amen. We're talking about Pentecost. That, 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 that when they were together, uh, let, the first thing you got to understand is if you are going to experience the fire, you got to prepare yourself through some practices. Somebody holler preparation. Somebody holler practices. The scripture says in verse number one, they were all together in one place. Now, if I had the time, I would go back and read uh, chapter 1, verse number 4 through verse number uh, 8 or 7 or something where Jesus told him to wait till you get cold with power. Then Jesus said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and other parts of the earth. And then the scripture says in verse number 14, and they gathered back in Jerusalem in the room, listen, constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. So this wasn't a room where folk were being left out. But whosoever wanted to be included, 
in the preparation practices got a head start on being primed to receive the fire, the Pentecost experience of the Holy Spirit. What are the preparation practices that I'm suggesting that you and I are going to have to do? Well, if we just were to take seriously the text that we've read, prayer is a preparation practice that we must be engaging in regularly if we are to be filled with the fire of God's spirit in an age of terror. You can't. Follow Jesus in this terror age without praying. I'm just trying to tell you now. Now, I know some days when I, I'm, not, I'm not prayed up. Because I, I see images of what I want to do to people. And I know that, <laughs> that's not a holy image. This is not a holy act. Certain temptations and struggles, despair, hopelessness, things that I know I got to spend some time, more time, not in prayer by myself only, because the scripture says they work together in prayer. How is it that we can live in this age without praying together? Some of us don't like anybody. That's why we don't like to pray to, for nobody. Like, oh, no, I'm just, no. No, no, no. Ain't it something that you, you do all kind of things with people? <laughs> you do criminal activity with folk. You will do ungodly activities with folk. You will cheat with folk. You will lie with folk. You will hate on others with folk. You go to parties with folk. But when it comes to your Christian faith, all of a sudden, it's a personal thing. It's not that personal. Because when you see God acting most powerfully in Scripture, God is acting in community. And we're going now into the house of prayer, a whole series where we're going to give all of us a chance to meet and build houses and homes of prayer, both the places where we live and even our own selves. And some of us are going to be too busy, too uninterested, too full of yourself to get two hours of your week to spend in prayer with some other folk. Can you imagine? Now, you got to remember the disciples were up in the upper room for 120 days. Now, you know they had to be doing something spiritual to put up with each other. For 120 days. I mean, Lord have mercy. Can you imagine spending 120 days with yourself? Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Like, if it wasn't me, I, if it wasn't me, I wouldn't love myself at all. Because you know you're a piece of work. I know I am. Amen. 120 days, they are together. And the scripture says they're in prayer. They're gathering, engaging in activities that create the environment for God to move, for God to guide, for God to heal, for God to comfort, for God to direct, for God to empower. Prayer, gatherings, Spiritual disciplines are preparation practices that you and I must commit ourselves to 
if we are to follow Jesus with fire in the age of terror. If you're not engaging in these preparation practices, you won't be prepared when terror shows up. Your natural response will be inadequate to sustain you and those whom you love unless we have practices of prayer, gatherings, and spiritual disciplines. In this season of this month, we're saying we're going to fast. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, Jesus, not to fast again. <laughs> I barely made it through the last one. But what if you looked at the fast not more about what you are abstaining from, but you did a Jedi mind trick on yourself and said, I'm going to focus on what I'm engaging in. Mm. I'm not going to allow my life in the age of terror to be overdetermined by consumption, consumerism, no discipline when I'm being called to have intentionality about engaging in loving God, loving myself, loving my family, serving the community and the people around me. Don't you know when you engage in those Acts intentionally, they make your heart less wicked. Some of us feel like the way you're going to become righteous is just by clicking your heels and wishing upon a star. No, no, no. It took a lot of work for you to be this, you know, toe up. Hello, somebody. He's, Jesus, Jesus told him, go spend 120 days. Why? Because Jesus knew. That would be a good start. <laughs> we say we're going to spend a month in some consecration. Why? Because that's a good start. You know you need the rest of your life to get yourself together. But you can't get yourself together if you don't have the fire of God's spirit burning. burning inside you to burn away all that stuff that you yourself would not give up. <laughs> See, God said, I'm not going to ask you to give it up. I'm just going to burn it away. <laughs> away. Away. Some of y'all ought to be excited about that. But God, if I just stay before you, I won't have to give up anything. You just burn it away. You just burn away all the things I was scared to let go of. I wake up one morning and it just burnt away. All the things that I thought I could never be free from. I'll lift my hands one day and it'll just be burned away. All the struggles that I thought would determine my level of joy and peace and hope. I won't have to worry about it because one day it will be burned away by the power of God's spirit. And I'll be able to step out into my destiny. I'll be able to come out of the upper room and not be moved by the terror that is awaiting me on the other side of that door. Lord, help me in here. God, I need, we need to be filled with your fire. Because your fire is what's going to burn some of this stuff away. But I got to be willing to prepare my heart. I know some of us, we a little younger, praise God, and we just always used to the microwave everything. You know, somebody else has done the preparation for you. But you, there's no substitute for you preparing your own heart the heart of your family, the heart of our communities for the move of God. 
So what were some questions? Some questions that, that, that you need to ask yourself. How are you preparing to experience Pentecost? Will you build a house of prayer? Will you engage in practices or abstain from practices this month? And if you need some, some tools on the website, all you got to do is go to the way berkeley.com backslash grow, and there's a whole matrix of engagement. You ain't even got to think about it. Just click on it. Oh, I need to think. No, no, no. Some, some of you do too much thinking. And don't be acting like you don't act without thinking. What was his name and her name and that job and that part? You know, you do things without thinking. I wish I had an honest church in here. You take a big old risk. I hope this works out. <laughs> but that's what I want you to do on this fast. I know this engagement is going to bless my soul. I know this is going to heal my body. I know this is going to help my mind. Don't think too hard. Just do it. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Uh, let me move on. I, 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 I can stay here all day. You got to be open, listen, to holy unity. Somebody say holy unity. The scripture is so powerfully clear that Pentecost fell when the people became united. They weren't uniform. They were united. How many know there's a difference between uniformity and unity? I don't need you to look or be like me in order for the power of God to fall. Because there's only one me, thanks be to God. There's only one you, thanks be to God. So God's not looking for no clones up in here. But God is looking for us to be unified. To be together on one accord. Because in our unity, where there is still difference, it allows for the manifestation of God to be seen, heard, and intelligible to others who have not yet reached our point of unity. I want you to think about this for a second. It was a strategic moment, Pentecost was, because the feast of Pentecost was happening in Jerusalem at the time, which meant that every male child, every male head of household had to come to Jerusalem to bring some of their harvest. It's almost like a big giving day to make sure the temple had everything it needed to take care of the widows and the orphans. Pentecost. So, of all the days for God's spirit to pour out with such unity and diversity happening at the same time. For it to have its maximum impact across the Roman Empire. Pentecost was that time. Because as you read through the text, you see what? Everybody under the sun, every Jewish family in different cultural contexts were in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit poured out upon a small number of people and these small number of folk were able to communicate intelligibly to a diverse group of folk the power and the actions of God. Could it be that you are uniquely situated 
to translate to your cultural group the good news of God in a way people can understand it. When Pentecost came to the early 20th century church at Azusa Street, it was a little old house, prayer house, on Bonnie Bray Street, I think. This Methodist preacher started a prayer revival. This prayer revival became so attractive and known that people from all over the world were showing up to this little old house because in the home they were seeing things they had never seen before. They saw black and white and Asian and Latino people from all different races in this little old house praying together, worshiping together, on the floor rolling around together. That's, that's why the old Pentecost folks used to be called holy rollers. Because they were known for rolling on the floor. They'd just be so overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit, they would just roll around on the floor. Be like little more holy rollers. And folk made fun of them just like in the text. Gave them all kind of despair. Them folk crazy. There was something wrong with the folk. They published articles in like the L.A. Times about this strange meeting that's happening where white and black folk are in the same building laying hands on each other, singing, crying, howling into the middle of the night. And it became so known that all over the world, people would come to Azusa Street. And it launched the 20th century Pentecostal movement that is now the largest, fastest growing social movement in the world. Not according to me. You should Google Mike Davis, the planet of the slums, anthropologist. And he, he, he says that the three fastest, most powerful social movements happening right now, Pentecostalism, hip hop, and Islam. What is it about the power of the Spirit of God? And given some of us, we are some hip-hop heads and the culture of young people, that we have the ability to reach every part of this world. It's only us over here now in this age of terror where we're becoming so intellectually hung up that we think God ain't real. Well, if God was real, why is so many people being hurt? If God is real, why is this? Why is that? I'm going to tell you stop asking those questions. I ask them questions all the time. I'm, 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 I'm in my bed. I'm on my, 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 my car. I'm everywhere. Lord, where are you? Because this is a hard season. But when you are a part of the church of Jesus Christ, this ain't the first hard season we've had to endure. We are not the first church to have to live through an age of terror. But we are the first generation that is slowly stepping away from the fire of God's spirit. And I want you to know, child of God, no matter where you are called, what you are called to do, lean in to the spirit of God. You may be a revolutionary protesting, burn the system down, but do it with the Holy Ghost. You may be a teacher in a classroom, do it with the power of God's spirit. You may be one of these folk who are committed to making peace in neighborhoods or a therapist or a counselor or a coach. But whatever you do, make sure the fire of God's spirit is burning. So whatever room you step into, people can hear the word of God. People can hear the good news of God in a language they can understand. 
Hallelujah. And that's why I love the book of Joel where it says in the last day I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Because God is wanting to remind you and I that unity is about us being together across all of our differences. You may be a male or a female. You may be slave or free. You may be rich or poor. You may be young or old. But when the Spirit hits you, it brings us together. So we can hear. So others can hear. The good news in their own language. And part of what is a challenge for us right now is we are being so polarized by our difference that the church is teetering on losing our unity. But I want to I want to declare that the Holy Spirit wants to bring us back to some unity with one another. We may not all agree. I certainly don't agree with all kind of things that folk is doing. And I just going to let Jesus work it out and help when he asked me to. And believe me, God's asking some of us for some help to be God's partner in the world of making peace and justice and healing and wholeness, correcting the wrongs. Fighting for the dispossessed and the poor. Making sure that your own family and your kin are in the best position and place to succeed. God's going to need your help. And with the power of God's spirit, you'll be able to do things that you could not do without the spirit. Somebody say filled with the spirit. The scripture finally says that they all were filled with the spirit. And how many of you know that there ain't nothing like having a full dose of the power of God in your life? There ain't nothing like uh, having no part of your life unfilled. Can you imagine what it's like to be in a room where God says, I'm going to fill every single nook and cranny that even a cobweb in the corner is going to have to move when my wind and my spirit gets to blowing. That even that part of your heart that you think is closed off because you're too hurt, you're too cool, you're too mad, you're too disappointed that the spirit can't move, that God is saying, no, I have a spirit that can penetrate even the darkest corner of your heart. I have a spirit that can change even the most convinced mind that God says I have a spirit that can transform you from who you are now to who God is calling you to be. But we have to be filled with this spirit. Stand with me.